This episode is brought to you by Unbountiful Gardens. Are your neighbors a bunch of maniacs who work from morning till dusk trying to turn their yards into a floral pageant of decadent paradise? Are you stressed out trying to keep up with them? Studies show that stress and worry are factors of heart disease. What could be more deadly than you working in your garden day after day with absolutely no hope of surpassing that jackass Lazar two doors down? You know everyone knows he's the one who put grub worms in Xenia Arbogast's yard last year when it looked like she was finally going to beat him in the HOA Best Lawn Contest. The Bible says to consider the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they spin. But Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Well, you'd look pretty good too if you had idiots slaving over you for six months a year, feeding you, watering you, digging around in your roots. Unbountiful Gardens is here to save your day. They'll come in and landscape your yard with flowers that will look just as good when they're newly planted as they do after you killed them by forgetting to water them the entire month of July. Brown clumpy patches. Brambles that look like Burmese tiger traps. Brambles that look like brambles. When January comes and the bitter winter murders the blossoms your neighbors have been working their fingers to the bone to raise all year, people will come to your yard and say, you know, if anything, it probably looks a little better. And now when our listeners sign up for a two-year landscaping project, they'll get a new zero upkeep reflecting pool at no extra charge. Already dense with algae and floating slime. This is your new reflecting pool. Holy cats, what's down at the bottom there? When you call, just give them the promo code reread, one word. And thank you, Unbountiful Gardens, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. Warning. The following discussion is deliberately riddled with spoilers and unhinged speculation on this nearly 40-year-old book. Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. You can't read a Gene Wolfe story. You can only reread a Gene Wolfe story. Welcome to Rereading Wolfe. We don't pretend that this is the first time you and we have read these books. We want to understand them in as much detail as possible, and that means considering the works as a whole. Hi, I'm James Wynn. And I'm Craig Brewer. Craig, we have a correction. Uh Uh-oh. Just at the moment all your doubt is gone, you may discover... Bilbo de Paula issued a correction on Facebook about our pronunciation of the word, well, we pronounced it cloisonne. Filippo says cloisonne. Well, you might be right, but, um, It would not surprise me if it is pronounced that way in French or Italian. But every English dictionary I could find, they pronounce it the way we did. And they might be giants pronounced it that way. And we're, you know, obstreperous Americans. The good news is that this won't come up anymore. Well, you know, one more time, briefly, (laughs) in an upcoming bonus episode, I bet. But only then. So let's part as friends and we'll just agree that our pronunciation is not above question. <laughs> I'm just following They Might Be Giants. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah, they are my watchstone. So, you know, Craig, I was moderately surprised at how few comments we got about Severian's conversation with his grandpa. Not that he didn't have a lot to say, just not so much about that. I was reminded in my recent review of theories of the frequent earth list and subsequent Reddit associations between the old guy looking for Dorcas's body and the old man who stands by when Severian is pulled out of the guile after nearly drowning. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Severian's pulled out of the water and he's sputtering and he says he saw Malrubius and the old man says, not a woman. The theory seems to be that the two old men are the same. I think there are major problems with this, especially since the Botanic Gardens old man says that he comes there every day. Yeah. And I can't come up with a satisfying theory of why the old man would be down south by the Citadel. Yeah, that's a long way. Not that people don't come up with theories. I just don't personally find those theories satisfying. They usually associate Dorcas with Jalinta in some way. Honestly, though, I get the desire to associate two important female characters who spend most of their time underwater. And I get the inclination not to leave an incidental character 
as only an incidental character. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's because Wolf so frequently does not. My point is, I'm still waiting to be convinced. Yeah, I don't think they're the same. And I don't really think there's anything in the text that suggests they are apart from the general sort of parallel of Mm -hmm. of the the way that they're, you know, a guy on the river <laughs> looking at somebody <laughs> underneath. But I do think it's maybe important to point out the similarity there in the structure of, you know, somebody pointing out and waiting or being suspicious of something that's underneath the water and a woman right. under the water. Yeah. And that I feel like could well be intentional and is sort of giving you these thematic repetitions yeah. that show up that, that are pointing out that certain things are important ways to, to call attention to things that I buy, but yeah, not the same character. Yeah. Court cut Goulet on Facebook had a really interesting interpretation of why father Aniri's mirror room has eight sides. He points to a Wikipedia article that says in optics, Octagonal prisms are used to generate flicker-free images in movie projectors. And that's all there is. Now, that's cool when you think of Wolf the Engineer. I mean, that may Mm -hmm. well have been something he encountered or knew about. And so it would be natural to make some kind of focusing device that way. Maybe. I don't know. But I I like it. I like it quite a bit. It reminded me of Michael Swanwick's assertion that Severian's fullogen cloak is a selective black a technical term from the solar collector industry. Swanwick wondered what other concepts Wolf was drawing industrial engineering from it that he was unaware of. Well, maybe this is one of those. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, we think of Father Aniri's little room as being hemmed in with mirrors or portals, but it could just as well be thought of as a prism in the midst of a room of universes. Yeah, that's cooler too. (laughs) That's a cooler idea. Um. Hey, Michael, Andre Drisi has an Ask Me Anything event coming up on Reddit. That's right. Uh, that That's right. Be a lot of fun and of interest to you guys. This is really great because Mantis really isn't a social butterfly. He enjoys talking to people one-on-one, but unless you meet him at a convention or something, you probably won't bump into him. He's an inside cat. And as far as I can tell, he doesn't go out of his way to allow those random fan encounters to happen. Honestly, who am I to judge on that? But He doesn't have a social media problem the way I do. (laughs) So this is an opportunity for you to force from him the answers you've bottled up inside. (laughs) And plus, he's got all this new stuff coming out right now. So it's a great time. Exactly. You know, the four novels, the new book on New Sun. And then if there's anything that's been burning you from all the versions of Lexicon Earthus or Wizard Knight or the Long Sun stuff. Right. Yeah. That was a good time. Well, the mods at the Gene Wolf subreddit have been going out of their way to arrange these things. They approached us about it. And I suppose maybe we'll do one when we finish uh, the shadow of the torturer, but you know, really Craig, yeah. we're already a walking, ask me anything. So I have to wonder what kind of interest there's going to be in a formal one. <laughs> yeah. Plus it makes more sense after we finish the book. Cause then we'll at least have met one milestone. Yes. Yeah. We'll have accomplished something. So prove that we're staying at least a little bit. Hey, Craig, I noticed you and Ian Kozik had a conversation on email that I wasn't involved in because I'm really not that into anime in any form and I've never played Dark Souls video game. Yeah, but he got me he got me interested in a movie that I'd heard of before but never seen called Angel's Egg, which is a 1985 anime movie that Dark Souls was in some ways based on. I mean, parts of it are directly lifted from the movie, but also there are rumors floating around the Internet in three or four posts or things that that actually the artist and the director had read New Sun and that it was heavily influenced by this. Now, we know that the artist of Angel's Egg, the primary artist, went on to do the covers of the Japanese versions. But as whether or not the director who actually wrote it had read New Sun, I've seen that a couple places, but not really sure. The movie, though, has a lot of good moody echoes of things that could be new sun like it definitely seems like you're at a kind of end of time situation there's all sorts of odd seemingly out of place biblical imagery large shadows that i mean in fact one of the coolest scenes is if, is when the shadows of these giant fish start flying around the city and these fishermen who had otherwise seemed like statues to me all of a sudden come up and they're going and trying to catch the shadows. And it's just this strange dreamlike thing. Otherwise the movie is a little bit more like a surrealistic dreamscape. I mean, there's 
a story of sorts in that you follow a couple characters through it, a young girl and a young boy, but otherwise there's no attempt to, you know, ground it really in, in any kind of history or anything like that. But it's just this beautiful evocative thing, which to me feels very much like what it's like to read new sun for the first time. So yeah, I was fascinated and, and glad I could finally see it. And I want to talk more about it because there's, there's more there, but it's, it's the kind of thing that until you see it, you can't, there, there's a lot of detail and weird imagery and just portions that you kind of need to hash out with somebody else. So I can't really summarize it well, but yeah. So angels, Egg, definitely something to look for. Right. On YouTube, Kelly Valinius has a book of gold origin story. I'll just uh, read uh from what she or he said, for me, the Book of Gold was a nonfiction book. It was a thick book, taller than my arm at that age, and I couldn't actually read it yet, but it was full of pictures of things that live in the sea, divided according to their biomes. There was no story there, just science. My mom didn't think it was really very appropriate for me on account of her finding sharks and angler fish and such to be scary. All I saw was beauty, though. In time, I learned so much about sea life from that book, but it had much more important lesson in it. It taught me patience. I couldn't read it, and nobody had the patience to read a couple-inch thick science book to me. To find out what it actually said, I had to learn to read first, and then I had to learn to pay attention long enough to get through a text like that, which most certainly wasn't meant for children's consumption. I wonder if I still have it somewhere. Well, I'd have read it to you, Kelly. I really miss having kids that I can <laughs> read to. My wife is a reader, but she doesn't have the patience for me to read to her. <laughs> and we got a nice attaboy on Chapter 5 on YouTube. Serious Gaming says, I just started rereading the Book of the New Sun, and I'm going to start reading along with this podcast. I'll begin by listening to this episode since I just finished this chapter. This is an amazing idea for a podcast. You both give great insight and commentary. I feel I may learn a lot from listening to you guys. Well, we'll see about that, Serious Gaming. I hope it's fun, too. I hope it makes you enjoy the book more the way it has for me. And it really has. We will teach you how to take very strange avenues down weird alleyways and <laughs> ideas about wealth. Yeah. yeah, let's see if I can spin an entire city out of this <laughs> painting stone. And we got an Apple podcast review. This is from Gas House Palooka, and the title is Aladdin's Cave of Glittering Treasure. I guess that makes us the wizard who leads Aladdin to the cave with the intention of killing him. <laughs> yeah. Still, Mr. Palooka doesn't mind. He says, Gnosticism, postmodernism, high church, low church, classical antiquity and classical literature, and so much more. This podcast offers ideas, hints, opinions, experts, and crackpot theories for explicating the great Gene Wolfe's marvelous body of work. The creators share their hard-earned insights, the remarkable community of Wolf scholars, and erudite and charming banter. Ooh. I have loved Wolfe's Book of the New Sun since I first picked it up on a friend's recommendation some 25 years ago. Hey, that's about the time I first read it. Hey, maybe he stole it from my house. <laughs> Trying to understand it or the spell it cast over me was like groping in the dark of Plato's cave. Mixed metaphor alert, gas house. But there is a connection between those two caves, and that's going to come up in a bonus episode I mentioned. So well done. Each listen to this podcast brings into view new treasures among the many, many glittering heaps. Three cheers and five stars. Very cool. Wow. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Gas House Palooka. And thanks to everyone for their assists, however they do it. Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, email. We don't care. And the problem with every good review is that we have something to live up to now. <laughs> <laughs> Look what you've done to us. So in this episode, we meet Dorcas at last. And for me, we have shifted completely out of the shadow of the Magian Tower and into this second thread that's going to carry us through the rest of the book. Severian's love triangle with Dorcas and Asia. So let's fish Severian out of the water and <laughs> get him reacquainted with his old friend Hildegrin, although it's going to take him a few more chapters to realize that. All right. <laughs> Chapter 23, 
Hildegren. Okay, to recap, Severian left the management yesterday. He met Talos and Baldanders and then Agia and Agila about a half hour later. Now, Severian has wrecked the Pelerines Cathedral and has their claw in his saber tash, but he doesn't know it. They're at the Botanical Gardens to cut an avern for a duel. On the way around the lake, they meet an old man who's been searching for his dead wife's body for 40 years. Her name is Cass. Severian is running to rent a boat ride from a guy. We don't know his name yet, but it's Hildegren. But suddenly he falls in the water and drops Terminus Est. He swims down, grabs it by the hilt, and someone's hand pulling him down. So. <laughs> it is definitely one of those moments. But <laughs> Wolf, Wolf definitely doesn't mind ending some chapters on... Cliffhanger. Yeah, crazy cliffhanger moments like that. Right. So with all his strength, Severian flings a sword out of the water, and someone grabs him by the wrist and pulls him out. It's not Asia. It's a younger woman with long yellow hair. He says it's streaming, which in this case means, I guess, that it's soaking wet. Hello, Dorcas. Severian doesn't get a true reveal of what she looks like until she gets cleaned up at the end of Lock Loves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Dorcas is very blonde. Severian describes her hair as like pale gold. She's very pale complected, like Severian himself. Severian describes her paleness as being the kind you see in someone who's very sick, but her complexion glows with health. She has blue eyes. Severian compares her eyes to an azure sky. She's short, slender. Severian says her face is too childlike to be a true beauty. At one point, Severian describes her face as a trifle pinched, which means, you know, thin and pale like an old lady's. I suppose that's a subtle reference to her being her grandma. There's always been a desire to associate Dorcas somehow with Kazdo, the mother of little Severian and, and Severa, because of the marked similarity of their names. And I suppose the discussion of the theories about Kazdo can wait until we get to the Sword of the Lictor. I'm just saying, I get the name connection, although I'm not yet satisfied with any theory. But Dorcas, Kazdo, like I said, Dorcas and Tabitha both mean gazelle, and Kazdo literally has a doe in her name. I get it. I don't know where to go with it yet. Wolf is still just smarter than me on this point. I know, and this is nothing textual at all, but I always, in the back of my head, for whatever reason, I always think the old man is named Kazdo. <laughs> and I think it's just the similarity with Cass, since right. he says Cass. But yeah, it's a connection that has always bothered me because it's wrong. <laughs> Severian starts to talk, but only water comes out of his mouth. He's too wiped out to say or do anything. He just sits for as long or more as it takes to say the Angelus. So, Craig, this is really interesting. The Angelus is a Catholic and Anglican devotion. The current mm -hmm. version is from the 1500s. It celebrates the incarnation in the Trinity. But the earliest version from the 1200s celebrated da, 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 the resurrection. But this welcomes us to speculate. What is the Angelus in Severian's world? Yeah. And when you first read it, most people probably think, oh, it's another word for rosary, which kind of, yeah, that's, you know, he's, he's saying is rosary of a sort. Um, at least that's what I thought. Something, a kind of common prayer that, that you go through. Um, it's another moment where I wonder about the religion of this time, because a lot of these things that get mentioned in Shadow of the Torturer don't show up later in the other books. Like, like mm -hmm. there are all kinds of moments and, and titles that we get for what could be church officials and potential little moments of ritual that just never get fleshed out later on, even when we're finding out more about the Pellerines, that all these right. little things don't necessarily add up to a full scale religion. And instead, it seems like, honestly, what it seems like to me is that a lot of times we'll put them in there as just things that look like a kind of old, half forgotten kind of Catholic ritual. But Severian gives the sense that he's not really educated much. I mean, mm -hmm. they're not, they're not irreligious. They're not atheists. But they don't really practice religion 
in any devout sense, right? Not that I can tell. At least the that I mean, they have their one ritual with their. Then they have a patron saint, uh, and they they you know go through the feast and the festival every year. But beyond that, you know, they mention a cathedral, but there's no sense that every week they're going to church services or something. Right, like that. right. Well, there's a there's a a chapel, and it's ruined. So which suggests that yeah, you know, it's. It's necessary for once a year. That's where they do it. But yeah, but no. So when you look at the actual Angelus, I mean, obviously, if it is pointing to the resurrection, that fits perfectly because this is a moment, mm-hmm. no matter which way you look at it, if you are reading it for the first time, then here's Severian coming up from the water again. It's almost like he's been baptized of a sort. He's fallen in the water. He's come out. If you know what's about to if you put together with Dorcas really quickly. Yeah, it seems like she's been resurrected then. So it still fits that mm-hmm. it's a. a a kind of prayer, but it's also sort of one of the few moments where Severian seems to have a moment of piety. And I, well, well, although he says, I rested there as long as it takes to say the Angelus. It doesn't say that he actually said the Angelus. <laughs> he knows how long it does take, which is, yeah. I, I did the current version of the Angelus and timed myself and it was just over a minute. Gotcha. But I do think it's interesting now that I actually look at it. Yeah. That he sat there as long as it takes to say it, but he didn't actually say it. No, he so, didn't say it. Definitely. Yeah. And and remember, this is Wolf translating. Of course. So the reason he chose the word Angelus might matter. But, you know, whatever that reason is, is anybody's guess. Right. Now, one other thing that always struck me about this chapter is that the way we're introduced to Dorcas is that she's already up on the sedge. And that she has pulled, it looks like she's pulling Severian out of the water. Right. right? Yes. Um, and that, of course, is totally confusing because in the the scene before, he's above her. I mean, like at the very mm-hmm. least, he, he talks about how he's being pulled down by her. So presumably he's lost consciousness or something, or he's totally lost, you know, lost track of, of himself. And Dorcas has somehow managed to get out. Of course, he's also got his boots on and, and holding Terminus Est, so maybe he's lighter I, or he's heavier. I don't know. But yeah, so that's totally disconcerting. And I think that for me, I, I do remember pretty quickly figuring out, okay, well, this is supposed to be the cast from the last guy's story. But then when I think, okay, well, is this the hand that grabbed him? Because she was already up there on the surface. And at that one little change really stuck with me and made me doubt everything else that was pretty obvious yeah. because it recalls back the last time Severian was drowning right he yep. thought the undying had taken him and thrown him to the bottom of the river and he came bursting through the top here we have the exact same thing someone is pulling him down and suddenly she's on top he's being pulled out right and it's important too to note that he didn't actually save himself. He got Terminus Est out. He got the sword out, and then he started to sink back down again. Mm-hmm. And you could say that that's showing a lot about his priorities at this point, yeah, that, yeah. that the sword is more important than he is, or he feels like that he's got to save it more than him, that he's still in some level thinking of himself as a member of a guild and perhaps as a shamed member of the guild um, more than something else. And so, yeah, you could say that's a, a good little symbolic moment there um, and uses his last strength to save the sword rather than himself. But it's a nice, clever bit of disorientation for the reader as well. Yeah. Oh, here's someone. She did come from from down below. But, oh, he tricked us because, oh, no, she, she didn't come from below. He was just wrong. He was confused. She was right. up above pulling him up somehow, even though he he was rescuing the sword at the very moment when he got grabbed by the at the wrist. Yeah. And even that moment about grabbing hands, right? In the, the, the last chapter ends with something grabbing him with a hand, grabbing his hand mm-hmm. um, and pulling him down. And again, another hand is grabbing him this time, but now pulling him up. So yeah, it could totally be, was he confused about what was grabbing when, you know, was his memory wrong there? That Yeah. You, I mean, we know of course that no Dorcas was the one down there in, in the moment, but the way he tells the story. Yeah, definitely does bring a lot of doubt. Two things that are still a little confusing in this scene is one, how did Dorcas get out of there so fast? You know, I guess she pulled on his wrist and came bursting through the water and got to the top. The other is how did she pull Severian out? She's smaller than him. She, everyone, you know, when 
Hildegrin looks at her, he assesses that she's younger than him and that Agia is maybe a year or two older than him. So where did she get the strength to do that? Yeah. And that's an excellent question because everything else that she does is in this chapter is basically sit and shiver. Right? Yeah. She walks around, <laughs> but she's just cold and weak and can't, uh, can't talk. Um, which right. by the way, is another fun thing that he tries to thank her too. And he can't talk either. Mm -hmm. And all that comes out is water. Right. Water pours from yeah. He was now. definitely so, drowning. So yeah. And they both lost the, the ability to speak for a short while. They're there. stacking. Yeah. Up, so yeah. where does she get her strength? And I think that's one moment that I've definitely seen some people speculate before on, you know, other things being involved here that, yeah. yeah, certainly we know that when you know the whole story that it's the claw, which is sort of whether or not the claw actually has any power to sort of focus Severian's star energy or whatever it is. This is certainly something that's done via the claw or via his star. Does it allow, well, maybe does it have the ability to levitate him? Does it have the ability to, you know, push him out of the water? And I don't know it, but those are all that sort of weirdness about this definitely opens itself up to all kinds of other questions, especially also about was something else involved? Like was Dorcas thrown up here by some other power mm -hmm. that was Severian or not? Was was there an Undine hanging out around here who's actually the one who's getting them? Um, right. uh, he talks about how the sword got caught in all the web. Was that mm -hmm. their hair? <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm possible um but yeah but i do like the fact that the way this whole the, the whole beginning of this chapter is written is that it it confuses not just what position they're in but actually it puts severian in dorcas's position too by with the the lack of speech with the confusion with the tiredness because like he says he just sits there and he right. pants and he's just as, as cold and wet as she is yeah. so both of them are kind of in this lost situation Right. right. The shore he's sitting in is just rotting marsh plants. You know, he's gasping for air and he's half sunk in the water as he just sits there. And the water is freezing cold. A man's voice that Severian recognizes but can't place says, pull him over or he'll sink. Severian writes, I was lifted by my belt. In a few moments more, I was able to stand, though my legs trembled. So I feared I would fall. Along with Agia and Dorcas is Hildegrin, a big beef-faced man. Agia asks what happens, and Severian sees that, quote, half-conscious though I was, I noticed how pale she was. So <laughs> two possibilities here. Either this is a misdirection by Wolf, and Severian is noticing a familiar paleness because she's really his sister. <laughs> I don't believe that, but we have to embrace the possibility or she's really scared over Severian nearly drowning or possibly scared of Hildegrin. Mm. I mean, she's going to be very sort of confrontational with them I think of that. and um, all those are there. Um, but yes. And, and as you very rarely seems startled by things like she's usually kind of in control and, trying to move with things but this is definitely a moment where she feels like she's yeah with the, the paleness has definitely shown some insecurity exactly hildegrin says give him time he'll be all right soon enough and then he says to dorcas who in phlegathon are you <laughs> phlegathon is one of the five rivers of the underworld that includes Styx, Letha, cockatus and Acarnon. they're named by plato it's typically understood as boiling hot it's mentioned in the Inferno and Paradise Lost and the Fairy Queen and Poe and Lovecraft, all the normal places for a wolf story. But I don't see anything that matters except that Hildegrin says, who in a river of the underworld are you? And that's definitely where she's from. We had talked in the last chapter about how the old man could well be. Chiron. The Chiron. Yep. So Dorcas is just stammering. Duh, 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 duh and then hung her head and was silent. She's smeared with mud all over and her clothes are rags. Hildegrin says to Asia, where did that come from? And she says, I don't know. I guess he, when he says, where does, where does that come from? He must be talking about Dorcas. Dorcas yeah. She says, I don't know. I just looked back and there she was pulling him out of the water. Is she crazy or chant caught here? You think chant caught, I guess uh, chant means a spell. So, Maybe that's a term for people especially affected by a garden. 
by the gardens. Yeah. yeah. One thing too, is she says that um, I look back and she was here with, with Severian on this floating path um, that the sedge is kind of like floating mush. And so mm-hmm. I had thought before it was just like the marshy edge of the land, but she calls it a floating path, which I guess it could be if it was just on the edge, but fun to think that this is not the only time we'll see some kind of weird floating living islands. Yes, islands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not just in this book, but in uh, short sun as well. Right. Exactly. So Varian comes to Dorcas's defense. He says, whatever she is, she saved me. Can't you give her something to cover herself with? She must be freezing. Hildegrind says he won't give her clothes until she's got all the mud off of her. He suggests putting her back in the water and swilling her around a bit. He gives Severian a metal flask to drink. It's shaped like a dog. And the stopper is, I don't know if it's a cork shaped bone or a stopper that's shaped like a dog's bone. But Severian drinks and offers it to Dorcas, who just stares at it. So Agia takes it and kind of forces it down her and she takes several swallows and hands it back to Severian. So the fact that they're freezing, maybe this is just a good time to point out how sort of ambiguous water is in not just this section, but in a lot of, but in a lot of the book that water is kind of traditionally a symbol for rebirth. Um, You know, and anytime you take like a high school English course and you're talking about like basic symbols and symbolism Mm -hmm. in Western literature, water is always the symbol of of rebirth. I remember even I had to do a whole thing in like an intro course in college, uh, intro English course where we had to like trace out every sort of mention of water and rebirth in Elliot's wasteland and it was oh, like all yeah. on paper. Um, but so water is, is kind of rebirth. Well, that fits with everything that we're going to see about here's a resurrection that happens in the water. We know eventually that earth is going to flood and that's, what's going to actually renew the water. But we're already, Wolf is very intentionally, I feel like mixing all of that resurrection and rebirth imagery of water with all kinds of pain and suffering. Like this is Mm -hmm. cold and muddy and dark and um, the same kind of thing that we we know is going to happen and that Severian's really going to struggle with in Earth of the New Sun is that the flood is going to be something that's rebirth, but it actually causes all kinds of suffering and kills people, kills, wipes out civilization. So already here, I feel like the fact that it happens in the water, but that the water is dangerous and pulling him down and there's a threat of drowning with it and it's terribly cold. And even though that they're, they've been saved, they still have to be careful of falling back in the water again. And so much of this chapter is about, can we find a boat that's big enough to help us? You know, a Severian's going to fall back in if he doesn't move again. So Hildegren has to pull him back. All those little things are kind of, connecting water with where this rebirth happens, but it's still a very dangerous, terrifying thing. Yeah. Um, and I just think that's really cool that if you, if you want to start tracing symbols, it's, it's really complicated. I mean, birth is dangerous, right? Yeah. And, and it's miserable. You know, kids come out screaming their heads off. They, they do vomit up fluid. It's yeah. It's very much like this, this scene and frankly, the scene in the guile as well. Yeah. And so much about this chapter is going to be how water is, they're wet and freezing. And, and so much is about Severian trying to get Dorcas dry or to, to suggest that she goes to another garden where things are drier, goes to the sun garden. And in fact, she'll, we'll talk about this later, but she perks up when he says the sun, right? She's, she's sort of like, oh, sun, you know, yeah. that's, that's something that, that catches her. I just think that's a really kind of cool thing. And it also fits so well with why Dorcas is going to say later, she basically has a phobia of water right? She's developed right. a really deep phobia of being in the water because it reminds her of this whole thing, even though it is something that brought her back to life or it's where she, she was brought back to life. Anyway, just wanted to point that out. And the fact that they talk about how they're both freezing right here. <laughs> yeah. And between Severian and Dorcas, this flask was half emptied. Now Hildegrin starts demanding to know who everybody is. Why is it his business? Well, it's his job to establish for the reader what everyone is going to believe about everyone else. This is important because we have to establish for the reader a credible understanding for what everyone thinks about Dorcas. And this leads to an interesting question. You said you uh, cued pretty quickly to that Dorcas was the missing dead woman uh, of the old guy in the boat. Just because since the name of the chapter was Dorcas and he talks about Cass. And then as soon as she names herself Dorcas, it 
that kind of sealed it for me. So you felt like she had been resurrected from the dead at the bottom of the lake? Um, well, I expected some magic kind of semen stuff to happen. <laughs> it's a you know science fiction book at some point. Um, so I assumed that, or at least I assumed that that's something I was supposed to be thinking. Oh. Yeah. But like I said, it's not like it was, I had decided once and for all, because at the same time, you've got this whole conversation where they kind of bring that up as a slight weird possibility because they talk about her being in a coma yeah, or in a right. coma thing. And, and so, but in typical wolf fashion, they're arguing about it. Right. And, and presenting theories about what might have happened and, and possible ways of doing it. And in fact, I always kind of come back to this chapter is the sort of archetypical wolf presenting a possibility, but talking about it kind of sideways and undercutting it and having one character suggest it and other people not believe it. And the truth is in there, but it's presented in a sort of kaleidoscope of different possibilities. And it's presented in an unbelievable slant. Yeah. So that you're, you're fooled by the fact that it's presented in that way. And I, I something, yep. a good example are, you know, whenever you see a, an expert in the uh, soldier of the mist, who's explaining Latro's visions and what he sees, it's plausible, but wrong. The, right. the theory that's presented by Vail, Vail's hypothesis, is appealing and believable, but probably wrong, mm -hmm. and, and which is demonstrated why it's wrong. The truth is, I don't remember what I thought at the time. By this time, there had been so many wackadoodle things that had happened in the last eight chapters. Mm -hmm. I'd probably stopped trying to justify anything I read and <laughs> was just letting it flow over me. Anyway, they're going to decide that she's a mad woman wandering around the lake. Maybe that something bad happened to her and she lost her memory. But Hildegrin says that the three of them don't look like regular tourists. He calls Severian's sword a whittle. American readers will know that whittling is when you carve wood with your knife. So a whittle is a knife. He's speaking ironically. Agia says that Severian is an armager in costume. Hildegrin says, just him? You don't think I know stage brocade, stage jewelry when I see it? And bare feet too? So this is probably a good opportunity for us to review all of the theater references so far. Think of how often plays come up in Wolf Stories. Fifth Head of Cerberus, uh, the, the Puppet Theater... Yeah, and, and and so even Soldier in the Mist, I think, has has uh, theatrics and a metaphor of the gods being like actors on a stage, where one comes on with one mask and then comes on again with another mask, and the audience just uh, agrees to go along with the fact that it's a different person, even though it's really the same person behind the mask. <laughs> Agia says, "Well, sure, I'm in costume. I never claimed to be an armager. I left my shoes outside. Hmm. I wonder." If those bare feet mean something other than just her poverty, they have a shop full of clothes. She couldn't just get <laughs> shoes. This is like her odd tendency toward nudity. I, I'll have to watch this one. Mm -hmm. Someone tell me if you have an interesting theory or illusion about her shoelessness. I kept trying to figure out if it goes back to something about the uh, sex doll like we talked about. Here. I don't know. I don't... <laughs> yeah, but even Barbie wears little plastic shoes. <laughs> It's not obvious whether Hildegrin believes her, but we'll find out later he doesn't, at least as far as Severian is concerned. In Claw the Conciliator, we're going to find out that Hildegrin knows that Severian is not just a carnifex. He knows that Severian is a torturer and that he is well out of place a day's walk from the Citadel. And so Vodalus decides to have him watched, which apparently they do, and they track him from Nessus to Saltus. A torturer outside the Citadel is weird. They are always on the lookout for things that are out of place. It, it, I guess it's just that simple. So now Hildegrin turns to Dorcas. He says, the embroidered baggage here has already said she don't know you. <laughs> Remember that Agia is dressed in like an embroidered peacock print dress. And then he goes on and the text feels a bit like garble. Hildegrin says, uh, and from the look of him, I don't believe her fish that you pulled out for her and a good piece of work that was too knows any more than I do. Maybe not that much. Who 
are you? That's inelegant prose, I have to say, Craig. <laughs> it took me a while to puzzle it out originally. To restate it, Asia doesn't know who you are. And looking at the fish you, Dorcas, pulled out of the water for her, by the way, that was pretty impressive for a little girl like you. But I don't think Severian knows who you are any more than me. Maybe he knows less. By the way, just to have fun playing with little over-the-top symbolism, I mean, a fish image of Severian mm. who could be a Christ figure. It's fun. I mean, it's small stuff, but it's there. And who pulled who out of the water? That's another interesting thing. It's, it's... Yeah. Finally, she says her name is Dorcas. And how'd you get here, Dorcas? And how'd you get in the water? It's clear you've been in the water. You couldn't have got that wet and muddy just pulling Severian out, young friend. She just looks bewildered. She whispers, I, I don't know. She doesn't even remember coming there. The last thing she remembers is, quote, sitting by a window, there were pretty things in the window, trays and boxes and a rood. There we go. Once again, a rood is a cross. And that's actually the definition that Wolf gives it in Castle of the Otter. So what she's describing could very well be the kind of jewelry making that we talked about. Um, and I assume it is that the sitting old man, in the window. Right. Yep. But a cross. I think of it as sort of like a decorative piece of jewelry. Oh. Um, but, you know, but for that to be the one thing that she remembers. Yeah. Is yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Overdetermined. <laughs> Hildegrin says pretty things in the window. Well, if you was there, I'm assured there was. Okay. Okay. Let's step back. Cool at Hildegrin. Or he could just be trying to like make her, you know, it's, it's funny how you read that depends on what you think about Hildegrin. Like sometimes, yeah. sometimes I think of Hildegrin as sort of just really aggressive to everyone. So yeah, he could be saying that in a flirty, but, but maybe even slightly aggressive way like that. Um, or it could be him trying to be very calm and, and just say, put her, put her at ease in, in the way that he might think he could be. Doing. Yeah. But you know, it is true that there's really not much very sexual about Hildegrin. You can't imagine any of his relationships, whether it's with Thea in the Necropolis or anywhere. He's always, he's kind of a fatherly or uncle right. figure. Although, oh, that reminds me. Somebody on Reddit just not too long ago posted something out of the blue on Hildegrin and talked about how they always had a huge crush on him as sort of like a big man bear kind of thing. Do you remember that? That was awesome. <laughs> oh, that was, that I remember really that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, but maybe he wasn't interested in girls then. So Ajia says that she's crazy. Either someone's been taking care of her and she wandered away or no one is taking care of her, which seems more likely from the state of her clothes. And she wandered in here when the curators weren't looking. Hildegrin doesn't like Ajia and he's inclined to disagree with her about anything. He says <laughs> it may be somebody's cracked her over the head took her things and threw her in the water, thinking she was dead. There's more ways in Mistress Slops than the curator's knows of. Okay, it's possible that Hildegren, who has dealings with the witches, might know a lot about time and space traveling nature of the mirrors of these gardens, or you know, maybe he knows back entrances into the botanical garden Thalus because he has to come here and do his excavating. I mean, and at least, I mean, at the very least, we know that the old man knows about how the manatees can get in, about how yeah. there are different ways for other things to get in. So, True. yeah, so he is saying that at least. But yeah, but he says it with a kind of like, I know something you don't kind of tone, mm -hmm. it seems like to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't like Asia, basically. And then he also says, or maybe somebody brought her in to be sunk when she was only sick and sleeping in a coma as they call it. And the water woke her up, which Greg is a nugget of a lot of curiositous earthuses out there. Yes, indeed. Ajia doesn't think so. She says, surely whoever brought her in would have seen her. And Hildegren says, they can stay under a long time in a coma. So I've heard, but whichever way it was, it don't matter much. Now she, here she is. It's up to her, I should say, to find out where she come from and who she is. Severian says, he, I had dropped the brown mantle and was trying to wring my guild cloak dry, 
but I looked up when Ajia said, quote, You've been asking all of us who we are. Who are you? He says, You've every right to know. Every right in the world. And I'll give you better bona fides than any of you have given me. Only after I does it, I must be about my own business. I came here because the young armager here was drowning and like any good man would, but I have my own affairs to take care of the same as the next. And with that, he pulls off his tall hat. He's wearing a stovepipe hat of some sort and reaching inside, he produces a greasy card about twice the size of calling cards. And he hands it to Asia and he looks over her shoulder and in a florid script, it says, Hildegrin the Badger, excavations of all kinds by a single digger or 20 score. Stone is not too hard nor mud too soft. I guess that's his motto. Ask on Argosy Street at the sign of the blind shovel or inquire at the Alta Camelus around the corner on Velaity. Okay. First of all, a badger is basically an, an import and export job. He's a dealer in food or other stuff that he purchases one place and carries for sale in another. Hmm. That would kind of work, but the way he describes it could be anything could be like a treasure hunter. But what you're describing is a little bit more like a, a trader of some kind. Interesting. So I didn't know that one. Um, but yeah, I still think that, I mean, badgers burrow, right? Mm, okay. He's yeah. Okay. Maybe it's a term um, for an ex for a burrower. Yeah. A digger that works for me, but why digger makes sense for me when I first read it, it didn't really make a lot of sense, but especially when you get to the scene where, you know, Severian's climbing down the cliff and he sees all the different ages, um, and all the things that are under there. And then they talk about the mine where they, they go and mine, not for minerals, but for technologies or for, tools or, or actually mine for things from different times to see what's been available. Then it kind of makes sense that that would be a job during this time. Well, maybe Badger is just his nickname then because, you know, Hildegrin the Badger, it's not really his job because it's obvious from the description that he does do excavations for whatever yeah. reason. And that's the thing too, that excavation makes sense once you learn a little bit more about the world. Like here, it's like, that just seems like a really specific kind of labor to do but once you find out that they're actually mines that are mining for things from older civilizations or older times then mm -hmm. yeah there's yeah like there's money to, there's money to be made even just south of of nessus as a matter yeah of it's kind of like a prospector it's just like right. a prospector but a totally different kind of mineral i just like the idea of it being a blind shovel like that that's the the inn the, what does that I, mean? I, what does that mean? I, I couldn't find the term blind in heraldry for like, you know, you might have a lazy eight or something like that. That all makes sense. I get that. I thought of it like the, like, like a, a you know, some, an in a sign of, for an in that's sort of like a, a joke or, or a lot of inns just have like random things for him though. It kind of makes sense. Like I thought, think of blind shovel. Well, shovel for a digger, that works. Mm -hmm. And then blind could either be like, he's not going to ask questions about what he's yeah. digging for. Well, I get that, but I thought it was his office and it's got a picture of a shovel and some way, maybe like an X over the top. Or over something. eyes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not generally the way you would say. Yeah. Or, or yeah. But in some way it says, you know, at the blind shovel, which it definitely says exactly what he does. His mm -hmm. office is called the blind shovel. Now, a reader posted a Curiositus Earthus on Reddit about two months ago. It was his first rereading of the Book of the New Sun. And he was already posting a theory. Redditor, the comic book guy. I just figure it is a guy. He says, and since we're talking about the puzzles anyways, let me give my explanation for a really minor one. Hildegrin's sign is the blind shovel, right? Could that perhaps be a sign with a mole, considering Hildegrin's business is excavations, it would make sense, to me at least. Perhaps Severian Wolf would have used the name of some prehistoric two-meter-tall mole species instead. But considering Hildegrin is called the badger, I do not consider it impossible that it is a reference to an animal. I'm going to link that 
Reddit post to the show notes. But I really like this idea. And as is my way, I've immediately begun stringing theories along behind it. <laughs> if the sign of the blind shovel is a picture of a mole, a mole is a spy embedded into an organization. And this would imply that the autark is not the only one of Vodalus's trusted aides who is actually working against his goals. So is Hildegrin working for the autark, the Asians? That one doesn't seem quite right for a mole, since he's actually working for the Asians himself. For the heroes? I don't know. Maybe the whole revolutionary organization, except for Vodalus, is working for the government. <laughs> <laughs> Have you read G.K. Chesterton's The Man Who Is Thursday? Mm -hmm. It's 100 years old. It's too late to claim I spoiled it for you. So it's a spy novel story. But a guy gets groped into a conspiracy against the government, and he's He's working to infiltrate this organization for the government. And then it turns out everybody else in the organization is also working for the government to infiltrate the organization. So there's a lot of strange things about Hildegrin. I don't have much of a grip on him for a really useful theory, but, you know, who knows? That's one of those two-step puns, too, that Wolf seems to love, where the blind mm -hmm. shovel is a mole, and then the mole, you take the pun of that word to go something right. else. Where that that seems definitely like things he would do. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's on Argosy Street, which right, is cool. a word that's going to come up with Vodalus's people, right? Yep. Argosy is a merchant ship or a huge amount of cargo, you know, like, like a boatload. So that is, you know, it's treasure. What's surprising is that its etymology is not from the Greek myth of the Golden Fleece or the 1960s Ray Harryhausen movie, Jason and the Argonauts. <laughs> Jason and the Argonauts shelled a ship called the Argos that was named after its builder, Argus. The word Argosy is from the term Nave Ragusia, a ship from Ragusia modern-day Dubrovnik in Croatia. But consider how easy it would be to assume that that term came from the famous Greek ship. Like I said, the passcode for the Vodalari is the Pelagic Argosy site's land. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Hildegrin chose the street to go with the passcode, or if the street was renamed for that reason, or if the passcode was named for the street because they're dealing with Hildegrin all the yeah. time. And I have to admit, I didn't even make that connection until I reread it this time. So I had <laughs> never remembered that Argosy was here until I did that this time. I feel like this time I immediately saw it. I'm like, it's the password. But yeah. <laughs> well, you can find him in his office, the blind shovel, or you can find him around the corner at a pub called the Alta Camelus, which a, Alta Camelus is a cross between a camel and a giraffe that went extinct about 5 million years ago. So, you know, you find him in his office. He's not there. He's going to be at the bar drinking on a street called Velaity. So Velaity is a word for will or volition. It's the lowest form of volition. It's just wishing not even necessarily wishing hard enough to do anything about it. You know, like, like me playing the piano. <laughs> Any philosopher who's considered the nature of will, going back to Thomas Aquinas, has considered the category of volition known as velleity. But what does it mean that Hildegrin's office is around the corner from a street called velleity? How would a street come to be called that? It is a good name for a street where there are bars, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. I, I, I'll i stop drinking. I wish I could, uh, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Very good. Yes. That's a good point. Yeah. That would work. That would work. It's, the other thing, too, I think, is that it's kind of a good thing to be associated with Vodalus and that group who are, yeah, they want to change things, but they're not really changing them for the better or you know it, mm. there's the sense that they're at least they're they're joining a cause so there's some goodness in that but when we find out more about it it's not at all the kind of highest hope that for this world that wolf has set up so that kind of fits for me a little bit more thematically honestly though i think if he was thinking of anything it just seems like a great place for 
a bar. <laughs> the, the great, <laughs> great kind of thing to associate. Or just I'll sit around and I'll drink and I'll think about the things I want to do, but I don't really want to actually have to go do them or anything. An Alta Camelus on the Laity Street in Lamarckian Evolution, essentially by will, yeah. the animals yep. change the, the nature of their progeny. So... The Alta Camelus on Valady. I don't know if he he intended anything about that. That's kind of cool though. That's a lot of for his for his business card. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot packed into a, a business card. But the fact that he has a business card does to me mean that he is a little bit more mercenary than really being for Vodalus. Or at least that's I take that as sort of his compared to Vodalus, like is he really on Vodalus's team or does he just work for him in yeah like a more mercenary manner um and we can talk about that more especially in the end of cloth when he shows up again and what he's doing there but i don't know Vodalus is attracting people who want to work for money um, but who may not be true revolutionaries or at least that's the the way that i kind of think about this that presenting himself as more of a business guy do we need to talk about saint hildegrin do you, I don't have anything about St. Hildegrin. You got, a, you got something that might apply? No, <laughs> not, not, nothing really interesting. <laughs> As often with these saints, if there's a meaning that's, I'm beginning to believe that most of the time their their names are picked for the similarities of something else that we don't really know what that is. Yeah, But no, I don't really, he was a bishop and was in charge of an abbey. And that's pretty much what <laughs> yeah. I know. And that's pretty much what there is. Well, you know, in Claw the Conciliator, we're going to learn a couple things about Hildegrin. One is that Hildegrin is not his real name. Right. It's a pseudonym that he uses. It's his real name that Vodalus calls him is something we're never told. So, you know, he's in disguise as well. And secondly, what is Hildegrin excavating for people in the botanical gardens? He's always there. The old man said so. Yep. Do they let people loot bodies as a trade here? Right. And that's my initial thought is, yeah, he's digging up people for various reasons, if if nothing else, that they're looking for someone who they're going to go eat, you know, like someone who is th- that they're going to perform the ritual on someone who maybe was just buried here. Or he does seem to know about how they seem to be preserved and that they can stay that way for a long time. So, yeah, maybe they're in. in of course, Vodalus does send him with the witches to get something from someone way in the past. So maybe he's here mm-hmm. looking for particular people who they think have some usefulness to the cause. All right. So anyway, he showed his card and Hillegrin says to Asia, and that's who I am, Mistress Slops. He likes that name, by the way. That's the second time he called her that, right? Yeah, yeah. He doesn't like Asia. <laughs> that's for sure. He notes that Severian is much younger than himself which we've probably assumed as well, that the Severian looks younger than Asia too, even though he figures she's only a couple of years older than him. Mm-hmm. So I guess he's saying that hers were hard years compared to Severian, yeah, who grew, was raised in a tower of torturers who beat him as part of his job. So, <laughs> Yeah, but he does have a certain, <laughs> you know, Certain privilege, a yeah, certain I, softness, I, I suppose. He, well, I mean, what he, he's trained as doesn't make him soft, but I suppose his, his yeah. mannerisms are uh, definitely not. Yeah, Somehow he wore it well. He ca- came off as a little naive in the wide world, despite his rather idiosyncratic background. He he has he's seen yeah. a lot, but it's a, a lot of a very specific kind of thing. He starts to leave, but Severian stops him. He says, you know, before I fell in, I met an old man on a skiff who told me that there was someone farther down the track who could carry us across the lake. Uh, He says, I think you must be the man that he was talking about. Will you take us? And Hildegrin says, ah, the one who's looking for his wife, poor soul. Well, he's been a good friend to me for many a time. So if he recommends you, I suppose I'll just do it. And so they go off to his scowl. Incidentally, a scow is a flat bottom boat with square ends. As Hildegrin leads them, Severian notes that his boots, it's Hildegrin's boots, that are greased, just like the greasy card, sank in the marsh sedge even deeper. Second time here, we've had something that's greased, right? His boots were greased. The card seems greasy. That's a, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Grease, grease, grease. 
Only reason I think about that is because of the coin. The coin being the counterfeit coin seeming greasy too. Well, is he greasing because he's diving? What is the whole point? What's with all the grease? I assume the grease was waterproofing. An old way to waterproof something is to sort of oil it up or put wax or something like that. That's what I thought. Are we supposed to derive something from the fact that he's much heavier than Severian? Uh, it's hard to say because they do describe him just as really big and beefy, right? Right. So he could just be going through just just a bigger guy, mm-hmm. which could also just suggest how sort of uh, flimsy the sedge and whatnot that they're walking on is. So it could be, but I, I don't have any deeper sort of, you know, is he is he some other kind of thing? Yeah, I don't know. I yeah. don't really have any idea. Yes, he's definitely not an exultant or anything like that. But the noticing that they sank deeper, if I mean, it, it puts me on alert. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, it does seem like the kind of thing that would be there to point out something else, but I'm not really sure what. Yeah, I mean, either. Well, Ajia says she's not coming with us because Ajia is a mean girl. <laughs> Still, it was obvious that Dorcas was going to come along. She's trailing behind Asia and looking so forlorn that Severian decides to drop back and comfort her. He sees that she's cold, but his cloak and mantle are soaking wet as well. So he suggests that she goes back the other way so that she can leave the Garden of Sleep and then she can go to the jungle garden to warm up. But then he remembers, you know, that Pelechiosaur, that big toothy lizard that he had to pull his sword on. Mm -hmm. So I guess he, you know, he really did find that particularly dangerous. Anyway, Dorcas isn't paying attention. He can see that Ajia makes her uncomfortable. Maybe he, she's afraid of her or detects that Ajia doesn't like her, but Dorcas just mostly walks around like she's sleepwalking. We see something similar to this in the Citadel of the Autark when Severian resurrects Miles. But Severian keeps trying. There's a man in the corridor, he says, a curator. I'm sure he'll at least try to find some clothes and a fire for you. Something I particularly noticed this time that never sunk in before. Aji has dark brown hair, chestnut. I've I've always thought of her as having, you know, black hair like Severian. Aji says, there are too many of these beggar girls for anyone to be worried about one, Severian, including yourself. Hildegrin, who isn't warming up to Aji, says over his shoulder, (laughs) I know a woman who might take her in. Yes, and clean her up and give her some clothes. There's a high bread shape under that mud, thin though she is. Um, We don't know about Dorcas's heredity, but there's no real evidence that her family is highborn, right? Yeah, and I mean, she's short, right? She's definitely skinny, but she's also short. And so far in the book, every height is always what you think about high bread. Um, yeah, even the kibitz are maybe a little taller yeah, than usual. Yeah, so I don't know if the skinniness or like the thin frame is supposed to be indicative of that, if that's what he's noticing. Because he talks about her shape. It's not like her face or something like that. And the one thing we know about her, she's very, very small and petite. So so the one thing, too, that I'm assuming that Hildegard is talking here that every, you know, we had talked before about whether he was flirting with her or, you know, making some kind of jab. But I assume what he's talking about here is probably someone like, a, you know, not not necessarily a kind person, but he's like, hey, at least I at least I always think I'm going to send her to a brothel. You know, at least I know someone who will right, take yeah. her in and make her work. Oh, you know, I didn't even think of that. I, yeah. And I don't know if that's me just being too cynical, but it's like especially after someone told us that the House Azure might be a whole district. Right. You know, the, that it might be a whole district of brothels. Well, that, that would work of, of what's here yeah. yeah but otherwise i mean well I look who hildegrin hangs out with right and, and he does know the witches so i don't know if unless he was oh, thinking about the witches another too. one well no they got um, surely they only take the young <laughs> just like the torturers who knows though? yeah but if she's if she really has kind of lost her mind you mm-hmm. know and if she's got a total amnesiac or something like that that mean they might take her for that reason too i don't know Right. But I don't know if that's who he means. The only other woman that when he talks about a specific woman that he might be referring to would be the Cumaean. But I don't know that, you know, a woman who lives in a cave is necessarily going to give her nice clothes. <laughs> so um, there's nothing about the Cumaean that thinks that that's a tender place to drop her right. off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So and then do time travel with other crazy people. Yeah. So so I don't know. But that that's just always this time struck me as a weird line. Like I assume that maybe he has some darker not darker just just you know unsavory purpose in mind there but 
I don't know. That's I'm I'm feeling more negative about Hildegrin. In the past, <laughs> I've sort of thought of Hildegrin as sort of a gruff, gruff but lovable, gruff but friendly guy here. And I mean, he does you know help these people out, but I don't know the the vibe I get this time. And I don't have anything necessarily specifically textual to point to. You, just I I feel a little. He's know, a criminal. He's rougher, but he's I mean he's a criminal, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Agia starts helping us out, though, with Hildegrin's job. She says, what are you doing here anyway? You contract laborers, according to your card, but what is your business here? He says, just what you said, mistress, my business. Severian keeps trying to convince Dorcas to go back to the corridors. Whatever you do, don't go to the jungle garden. <laughs> go to the sand garden instead. Okay. Sand garden has special meaning to her, which is interesting, but I don't understand why. Severian writes, something in what I said seemed to touch a chord in her. Yes, she whispered. Yes. The sand garden? You like that? And very softly, sun. So what the heck, Craig? Right, really. But I think it's a really cool moment because, of course, the first time you read it, we just don't have a whole lot of how the sun is caught up with all the mm -hmm. religious imagery in the book. But when you think back on it and we know what Severian, I think is we talked about what we think he's in touch with in the sand garden. I feel like it's some kind of connection there and the whole messed up sort of dreamlike trance state that she's in. She's got some kind of weird intuitive connection to all this more divine imagery. And in fact, I mean, if you want to think about it in a couple of ways, she's, First of all, yeah, the, she wants to go to the sand garden because it's warm, right? She says the sun, and that would be something that would warm her up. And so there's that. But she's just been resurrected. And even though we know she's going to suffer a lot, that was the power of a sun, of a star, or of a white fountain that did something like that. And we know that that the sun is also connected with the, the sort of divine origin or divine life-giving powers and stuff like that. So the fact that she has this intuitive attraction to the sun at this moment totally makes perfect sense that she's just been touched by mm -hmm. a sun by Severian's star power <laughs> or whatever it is and and we know that that's also a symbol of of the divine in many ways in this book yeah I mean I feel like that's why she's having this moment and that's whether or not there's a specific plot reason there it absolutely makes sense for Wolf thinking about you know how what we're going to learn later about the larger story here to sort of connect those things in this weird point that here's a woman who's just been resurrected. She has some intuitive grasp of, of how important or, or healing the sun could be. And so, yeah, she wants to, to touch it's it. A, okay. So we assume like the sun in the jungle garden is the past. Is the sun in the sand garden? Is that the future sun? Is that the new sun? Yeah, I don't know. Um, he, when he was there, he didn't, mention it being a different color right. did he no no um but you know it's very boring. he does talk about in the jungle garden how it's a it seems like the shadows are sharper right, right. um where he says something along those lines and so it seems like it's a different sun um like a different time or am i making that up uh, no <laughs> no he did... doesn't say a different time but it, it, it's it's a golden sun right it's a golden, golden sun right yeah yeah so yeah in the sand garden i don't know i mean i'm not sure if it was future, I mean, could it, uh, and I don't know that we have enough to know if the sand garden actually is in a different time, if there's enough there, or if it's just connected either just physically or somehow, I don't know, vaguely spiritually with what he. Well, even if it's, I don't mean a trans portal, but maybe it is connected, you know, just like the jungle garden is obviously not the sun that Severian is used to seeing this one that could be the past and this yeah is i mean future. who knows the sand garden could be the beach <laughs> right or, or close to the beach where he is on ushas right at the end it could be it's right. hard to say but my feeling is less that it's a specific place or a specific thing that she's drawn to other than just what the sun means well i mean considering severian's connection to the sand garden and he does have a, mm -hmm. a special connection to the sand garden it's not surprising i guess that his grandmother would too, maybe if we understood what Severian's yeah. connection was. Yeah. That could be, that could be. And I don't know if it's, I guess my thing is there, it doesn't seem like it's really the sand garden in particular that she's drawn to and more just the idea of the sun 
Um, and I could be wrong about that. Just since the only word she mentions mm. is sun and that Severian said it's sunny there. Yeah. That it could just be the sun. That she's could be coincidental. About. Yeah. Um, but one other thing I wanted to talk about here is Severian's attitude towards her, because I've often felt like in shadow in particular, the way Severian reacts to women is indicative of his, I guess you could say moral development or just of him, him growing more mature. So you immediately you have Thecla first mm -hmm. and well, I guess, I guess you'd have Catherine first, but, but you yeah, have Thecla is the real one who he has a crush on basically, but she calls him a boy and, Mm -hmm. And in those chapters, she's always talking about, you know, I was, that was when I was going to become a man or something like that. So in those chapters, he's very much still aware of himself as very young right. and, and maybe even not feeling like he's, he's quite on par with Thecla and feeling like she's more mature than him or something like that. So it's a crush for someone who he feels like is, is his superior in some way or another. When he gets to Asia, then it's more lust. And it's just full on attraction. And I feel like in some ways, this is kind of how I think you could say a lot of people's <laughs> development is that, you know, when you're very young, you have sweet little crushes on people. <laughs> then you go through adolescence and, you know, your early adulthood where, you know, lust kind of takes over. But then you finally hit a point where you have someone who you actually want to take care of and that that's what Dorcas is. And so Severian's kind of moved from this like puppy love to this attraction for Agia where he's actively engaged in trying to, you know, in some ways flirt with her and, 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 and kind of pursue her. And then Dorcas, and in this scene in particular, this is the first one where when he falls back and tries to, and starts to worry about her and say, hey, you could go to this place or you could go here. And then he thinks of the, the lizard and he's like, oh no, that's bad, bad. You know, he's like, I've got to change that. And then he tells her about the sun garden. It's a subtle thing, but right here, he's definitely worried about her and wants to help her in some way. And, and I think as he is picking up on this, that mm. his attention is being changed, right? His attention is definitely falling off of her and, and going on to Dorcas and, and she's definitely reacting to that. Right. But you also, I think, start to see Severian develop a little more where in both with both Thecla and Asia, he was wanting something from someone like wanting their, attention or, or wanting them to want him back or something. But with Dorcas, it's the first time where he's like, no, I just want to take care of you. And that's a, a different kind of caring for another person. So those three women are sort of, I feel like you, you get little steps here of Severian figuring out better how to relate to people. <laughs> but so, and I just want to point that out because those are, those three moves <laughs> are to me pretty indicative here of how Severian is already starting to overcome and, his upbringing a little bit. Well, Hill, Hildegren arranges everyone in the boat. Severian sits in the back, a Dorcas next and Hildegren rowing in the middle and then Asia in the bow. Asia tried to insist that Dorcas sit in the bow and herself next to Severian, but Hildegren wants Dorcas in the back where he can watch her in case she starts acting crazy and does something to unsteady the boat. But Dorcas piped up and says, I'm not mad. It's just, I feel as if I have just woke up. Hildegren mentions that he's had as much as half a dozen in the boat with him before. And he doesn't say that the half dozen were alive. Severian says, Hildegren's boat was like himself, wide, rough, and heavy looking. We're also told he's wearing a fear not coat. Fear not is a thick woolen material used for overcoats. The lake here is called the Lake of Birds. Again, Lake Avernus in Italy is called the Lake of No Birds. But unlike that lake, the Lake of Birds isn't formed over volcano, and so there's no deadly gases that are killing the birds. But Hildegren does say that the lake is called the Lake of Birds, quote, because so many's found dead in the water is what some say. But it might only be that that's because there's so many here. Then he goes on. He says, there's a great deal set against death. I mean, by people that has to die. Draw on her picture like a crone with a sack and all that. But she's a good friend to birds, death is. Wherever there's dead men and quiet, you'll find a good many birds. That's been my experience. And now Severian remembers the thrushes in the necropolis, which brings to mind those birds you speculated about, Craig, 
where mm. Severian first encountered Hildegrand and Vodalus. But I, wait a minute. What does Hildegrin mean? There's a great many bad things said about death, quote, by the people that has to die. Yeah, that's... Curiositas Urthus. Now I want to bring back how much heavier Hildegrin is than mm-hmm. Severian. What if Hildegrin's name, his real name, is something like Hidalgoite? And for people who haven't read the Book of the Long Sun, you'll just have to wait for that. <laughs> but you could go ahead and explain that. <laughs> I, I feel like that's if for where you're going. You gotta you gotta spoil things. <laughs> well, it's not very serious. It's not really a serious a spoiler. But in the Book of the Long Sun. Uh, mechanical people are called by, they all have individual names, but they're all named after types of minerals. Gotcha. And so, I don't know, you know, he doesn't have, Hildegrin isn't his real name is all we know. We aren't given that name. And as far as I know, the heaviness of his tread and this little bit about talking about the people who has to die is the only sign I know of where you could you know, string together something to say, well, you know what? Hildegrin is, is just not like normal people, but at the same time, it is there. That's cool. I never really thought of it in those terms. I mean, honestly, I always took that as just kind of his way of talking. I mean, cause Hildegrin's one of those characters that Wolf has, who always seems to have a weird turn of phrase about things. And it's sort of just a, a cheeky way of saying, you know, those that have to die when he really means everybody has to die. But, but it's sort of like, it's sort of like, Talos, when he talks about time to get up, ball danders, and eat, sleep, and defecate. Yeah. It's all these things that uh, Talos will never do. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else about Hildegrin when we see him again that suggests this. Mainly just because I'm. It's so different from the other sorts of mechanical people that we meet. I mean, I was joking earlier about how, oh, maybe they were heavier. But then I thought, you know, all the other mechanical people in New Sun, none of them are particularly big except for Sidero. But he's supposed to, like, actually be armor. Um, like, he's a he's an armor that someone else wears. But everyone else, Jonas. Well, that's something else we know about Hildegrin. He is solid. He's right? solid, yeah, but but Jonas and Talos, they're normal sized. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Talos isn't hmm. necessarily the same kind of thing. True, true. Talos, Talos is a custom job, but um, <laughs> um, huh? Yeah, I just don't. I mean, it would kind of make sense then that he's. I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to think of other things like a digger. A digger kind of sounds like mm-hmm. a machine. Um, Certainly in Long Sun, they're the the underground tank people. <laughs> I mean, who you know who go around the tunnels, right. so they're underground too. Hmm. It could be. It's one again, one of those things. I'm not really sure what to do with it. Just you know, I'm not not at all saying it's wrong. I'm just trying to think. No, no, it's 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 definitely it doesn't change the yeah. plot one yeah. single thing, as far as I know. There's no hidden. Oh, that explains that. Uh, it's only yeah a side issue, right? It's totally off track. It's just the kind of wolf theory that you, <laughs> you, know, you don't like really, I, which I get. It doesn't, it doesn't really change anything. It doesn't add anything. It's just, you know, what if, um, but still. It could be there. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's there. When I mean, you stop to st- think about why is that there? No. And, and I'm, you know, there's, and in these points, it definitely is suggested, you know, now that you're putting things together, I think that's, certainly there Mm -hmm. oh i like it especially if it tells us a little more about other things about i mean because yeah because when they don't really stress talus's metalness very much but with jonas that's the whole thing that the like severian's like oh he is made of metal right it's like full-on metal and so he could be heavy there too Mm mm-hmm yeah i don't know i think of it more like i said i i kind of took that as I still feel like him saying those that have to die. I mean, I guess it could still work very much the way I I like that line. But, but for me, that line is more about a sort of ironic way of, of joking about death that, that is, I mean, and it could still be both. I mean. Oh yeah. 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 People have to, people have to die. And so they say that about death, you know, Wolf can certainly mean two things at once. It's certainly happened before when he says something. That's true. Well, and of course, 
if he says, you know, people say this because they have to die. Yeah. But I'm Hildegrin and I say something different. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm curious. And especially since, and now I'm, I'm looking back at his business card again. I'm trying to say like, is there something there? <laughs> Single digger or 20 score. Yeah. I don't know. Blind shovel. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't see anything in it, but uh, maybe the grease, you know, maybe he's greasy he all the time. Because... Well, that, I mean, I did think it was, it's odd that his card is greasy. He has to keep his gears going. I don't know. I mean, it makes sense that his boots would be greased to be that, but, but yeah, but why, why did the card get greasy too? I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Well, you assume he's, yeah, I don't know. I, I could, you could go either way. It proves, it proves nothing, but it doesn't, it's it's there. Well, no, that's actually if you're just looking to put every little single thing back together, that would that would maybe make more sense for why the card was. Cool. Also, you know, you we made we kind of had a discussion in chapter one that Severian ran into Hildegrin, and then he, and you know was knocked over. Yeah, he barely read. And Hildegrin barely notices it. He says, "Oh wait, someone just ran into me." Yeah, I don't know. It's it's odd that you're convincing me here, <laughs> <laughs> but but you're actually you're you're. But you watch out. You don't hang out with me too much. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's yeah, that's a good point too. I don't know. Okay. I'll think about it. I'm actually going to, after we stop, I'm going to go read right. those other sections with Hildegrin to see if I can find anything, but okay. But no, I, so to talk then about just about death when, when he does bring it up. Um, and then he talks about, I, I like the image here of death as an old crone um, because it's not the stereotype that we mm-hmm. have. Right. I mean, most of us would think of the tall hooded figure right. with a side as sort of the typical thing. But here, apparently, the stereotype is an old woman with a sack on her back, yeah. um, which I've seen, at least I think I've seen like medieval depictions of death, not necessarily as an old woman. I haven't I've rarely seen death pictured necessarily as like an old crone, unless I'm I'm totally blanking. on. He it. says that he, he starts he's going to mention the Kamehameha in a little bit. And that's exactly the way she looks. And Hildegrin is her sort of friend, or at least, you know, not Mm -hmm. terribly disposed against her. That's true. That's true. So could he be talking about the Cumaean there? Mm. Huh. I don't know. I'm not sure. But that's another thing I want to go look at. Um, But yeah, so then just to the birds, like birds and death. There's a lot of ways to think about that. I mean, birds gathering around death, carrion birds are certainly part of it. That doesn't seem like exactly what he's suggesting here. It's just that birds like to come where there's quiet yeah, and dead yeah. men. Um, and it's more like a, and I don't know. I mean, people often talk about, you know, birds carrying your soul and that after there, there are tons and tons of legends of, you know, when someone dies, having a, a bird immediately come to the person uh, or the people left behind um, tons of legends like that. Well, ravens and crows are, they're frequent uh, figures at battlefields. Mm-hmm. People would have would have seen these these things all the time, or you know any kind of mass graves. If, That's if there's true. A lot of That's disease true. or something, and yet they are the emissaries of I don't know all all of the big. You're nobody if you don't unless you have a chrome as your emissary, whether it's Odin or Apollo, uh, <laughs> Mag. Oh wait, witches again. Yeah, Hildegrin plays tour guide. He says that now that they're in the middle of the lake and have a full view. They can see the bogginess around the lake gets firmer and rises and then suddenly gets populated with trees. And that's because the whole garden is supposed to look like the mouth of a dead volcano, or as some people say, the mouth of a dead man. Hildegrin says that's silly because if that's what they wanted, they would have added teeth. (laughs) So we get some information that they entered the garden through an underground pipe. They can also see the cave of the Kumean. So, you know, given that the garden is supposed to suggest a volcano, and that it's called the Lake of Birds, this is really completing the picture of Lake Avernus. The Kumean, he says, is the woman who knows the future and the past and everything else. There's some that say the whole place was built only for her, though I don't believe it. Dorcas asks, oh, how can that be? She's asking how the Kumean could know all of that. But Hildegrin either misunderstands her or pretends to misunderstand her. And that's not me being paranoid. That's what Severian writes. So perhaps Hildegrin just doesn't want to talk about the nature of the witches and how they do what they do. And, you know, that's too bad because I really want to know that. Hildegrin answers a different question, which is, why was the Britannical Gardens, or at least the Garden of Indus Sleep, 
built for her. And he says, they say the Autark wants her here so he can come and talk without traveling to the other side of the world. I wouldn't know about that, but sometimes I see somebody walking around up there or a couple of jewels flashing. But Hildegrin doesn't know because he never goes to the cave, he says. He says, I don't want to know my future and I know my past better than her. People come sometimes to find out when they, they'll be married or about success in business, but when they do, they usually don't come back. It's kind of like that fountain. So we won't have a good opportunity to talk about the command until the end of Claw, but do you have any idea what he meant about flashing? Is he meaning that the Autark's crown or something like that? Yeah, or, I mean, when he talks about metal, I assume, I think like a sword or a shield or, or something you know, like a soldier going up there is usually what I think, but we've just been talking about robots. Um, so, and, but I don't know if he really just means, you know, what I see something from, I, you know, some, some way that you could tell that somebody else was there right. from far away. And so that you see a little flash mm. on something. That's the sort of common sense type of thing. But yeah, but the fact that he brings that out, I'm not, I'm not sure. Cause when he says, I see somebody walking around up there and, but it could also be like, equipment or it could be a flash that's not a reflection of something else but he's actually seeing something who knows magic or technological happen and he's just assuming it's light shining off of something else and we just don't really know right but it is interesting that he says he never wants to go find out the future but then the next time which is if suggesting yeah and i never go talk to the kid <laughs> the next time well, not next time we see him but then he is traveling with the Cuman. the last time we see him for sure yeah well yep I do like the fact that he says people want to know, they want to go know things, but they, after they find out, they rarely come back. So it's right. never good news, apparently. They learn. <laughs> or not usually. Or they don't like knowing the future, that knowing the future yeah. turns out not to be a good thing. Right. The one thing I think about is that the Cumaean definitely seems to know how to be able to actually travel through time, or at least to make it seem like you're traveling through time and get visions of different times, because that's precisely what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. So here, knowing the future, it is kind of a, a good Wolfian way to half describe what's going on. Like she can actually, in some ways, see the future because she's able to actually go at different places in time. Um, so that's a good, a good, fun kind of way. Like you say, people say she's a soothsayer. Well, in fact, what she actually is, is a time traveler, right? So that's <laughs> a, that's a good, that's a good Wolfian kind of switch. Right. Things. But yeah, and, and on the fact too, about, about the point where he answers a different question. It's it, he does kind of get around to to something about that, but he never explains how she knows how she knows these things. Like like when because Dorcas says, "How could that be?" and yeah. he never. One thing I wanted to point out is that when he has this line about that the Autark wants to to be able to come talk to her without traveling to the other side of the world, that doesn't preclude that she actually is on the other side of the world, and that the garden was just yeah. made <laughs> as a, an easy way to travel to that place. Which is kind of for him to, yeah, a close, a, a close window for him to access. Right. And that's usually what I'm thinking. Right. But we don't know. It is, it is kind of a weird thing for, as folks say, uh, because then it wouldn't really be a secret. And so I guess the Cuman isn't it. Well, loads, loads of people know, because like he says, he sees people come and go and look up there. So lots of mm -hmm. people know that she's here yeah, apparently. And so I think the flashing must be some sort of signifier that, oh, well, this must be uh, someone who could yeah. be the Autark. And it's odd that the Cumaean and these interstellar flowers are here, right? These these alien flowers, mm -hmm. which just halfway makes me wonder, okay, is this actually still on Earth? Or if the Cumaean is some kind of extra terrestrial thing have they gone to some weird different planet and that's why the mm. the foliage is there i don't know but that's one other right. thing about the flowers being alien and they bring them in here it, it gets confusing but because we'll get the manatees back again. <laughs> well all we know is that the trouble is the witches right we don't know what the witches right. are, are after we know what the heroes want we know a little bit about what the megatherians want but the witches the command says that she's not one of them yeah she they pay their rent yeah you know, they cooperate with the heroes maybe they cooperate with the megatherians elsewhere yeah. just in order to be there for whatever reason i am curious where the pipe comes up like are they does it just drop them out on the edge i mean i guess it would have to if it's like a circle i guess the pipe 
is because you have to enter, but everything is surrounded by like high ridges. Mm -hmm. So you have to come through a pipe, an underground pipe that goes, that comes out from underneath the mountains. Yeah. Okay. So now they're totally in the middle of the lake. And he says that the garden of the sleep rose around us like the sides of a vast bowl large flat open spaces are said to be like this but in this case it really is a bowl right it's supposed to be like a like a like the inside of a volcano yeah which is such an odd image and and he just brings it up right it's never mentioned before that this is supposed to be in a volcano as never mentions that i don't think and mm-hmm. and so it's just they he says that yeah this whole thing's supposed to look like that and we're like oh right it is I didn't know. <laughs> you mentioned is there another lake yeah lake avernus is a is in the middle of a of an extinct volcano and the uh, gases from that volcano filter up through the water. And when the birds come and sit on the lake, they die. And that's why it has no birds. And that's why it's called a uh, Vernus, uh, gotcha. Vernus meaning gotcha. birds. So this could be Wolf playing with that idea, but thinking about it in a couple different ways. Exactly. Okay. No, yeah. exactly. Because uh, Avernus is the lake of no birds. This the is birds. the lake of birds. Why is it called the lake of birds? Because they find so many dead birds on the water. But that's just probably just because there's so many birds around. Gotcha. So, cool. Okay. The edges of this bowl are mossy with pines toward the lip, scummed with rushes and sedge below. The wind is really cold, and sitting in the boat doing nothing is making Severian colder. He's sitting there worried about the effect the water is having on his sword when he can't dry it and oil it. Severian spends a lot of time thinking about whether his exactly. sword is happy. And more and more as time goes on, too. Just <laughs> another point about the wind. If we're in a room, no matter how weird and mirrored it is, if there's that much wind, you can't mm-hmm. be in a room. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like you can be right. in a room. Right, yeah. <laughs> we have vast air conditioners blowing all the time from vents in the side of the wall. And we get an interesting bit next. Severian says, even so... The spell of the place held me. A spell there was, surely, in this garden. I could almost hear it humming over the water. Voices chanting in a language I did not know, but I understood. I think it held everyone, even Hildegrin, even Asia. It's such a weird way to describe that, too, because he doesn't say that he actually heard voices. Instead, it's the humming that was like voices in a different language that I understood. I mean, that's a... That's a right. It's a really sort of drawn out, odd comparison there. Really, just to get like he mm-hmm. says, more of a feeling than anything specific. But but I really like it, and I I don't know. Right. Got to admit, I don't know what it means. But just the sense that that something about it's just spooky is, and magical yeah. there, and yeah, which uh, again makes me wonder: is this even on Earth? And I'm yeah. kind of I don't know why I like that idea so much. But you got the Cuman who is definitely a cacogen of some form or another, you've got the the flowers that are from a different place. So I don't right. know. I want it to be on a different planet, but I don't know. <laughs> well, I, you know, you know, I think, I think it has, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, it kind of is on a different place. It's different yeah. time, different place, but it's, it's duplicated. It's like that. It's like that fish in mm-hmm. Father Neri's mirrors. Mm-hmm. That's what I think. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the witches seem to, know how to play that game pretty well yeah i i never saw any any mirrors when severian goes to see her at the end of claw of conciliator but she seems to pull the same thing off so yeah so hildegrin rose and they all sit in silence he sees geese on the water far away so you know once again unlike lake avernus for which the avern gets its name the birds can sit safely on the water He says, one time, like something in a dream, the nearly human face of a manatee looking into my own through a few spans of brownish water. Uh, You know, manatees have front facing eyes, but beyond that, I've never really thought they look human at all. (laughs) When I first read the book, I wondered if there was going to be a connection to the Undines and Severian that Severian met to these manatees, but I never detected anything. But it also could be that it's not a manatee at all, but he's just been given that that way to explain seeing faces oh, under the water. Yeah, right? there could be. Um, yeah. So who knows? Maybe this is an undine. Maybe this is a floating corpse that comes around. But but it it would be very convenient that 
right? The old man in the chapter before and said, yeah, there are manatees swimming here. And, right. and that's an easy way to explain something really creepy <laughs> that you see <laughs> down there. Um, yeah. So just a strange place. Um, this is as weird as the jungle garden is. I, I love the descriptions of this so well, just because it's one of the places where I feel like Wolf did such an amazing job of making it strange and where you never quite know what's going on mm -hmm. or what it is, where it is. Uh, this is the perfect thing that I love about the Botanic Gardens is the feeling of this, this whole room right here. Yeah. Room, place, portal, <laughs> whatever it is. Whatever, wherever yeah. we are. Right. So. so that leaves us. We're going to have to leave Severian in the middle of the lake with uh, his two girlfriends, very awkward, and Hildegren. And... I will find out what happens <laughs> next time. And we're getting closer and closer to a showdown of some kind. Yeah, yeah. So we find the strange flowers. But not as soon as you think. No, <laughs> okay. nope. But no, I, we're, we're close to the end of the gardens here because pretty soon he's going to have his flower and have to head off to head off to yeah. the end and the challenge. But yeah, we're deep in the midst of the weirder parts of Shadow of the Torture, where he's bringing up all kinds of questions. But it's also really cool that what he does in these chapters is that's where we also introduce characters that are central to everything else. And he meets mm -hmm. them in the midst of all this other weirdness going on. Asia, Dorcas, Hildegrin to a certain extent. But the places that we're coming in to know about these characters are in the middle of places that we have tons and tons of questions about. So there's nothing really stable about either their personalities or about what Severian's doing or going through. It's just, everything is confusing and up in the air. And right. um, I think that's one reason why shadow works so well and why so many people get hooked is because he's got, you know, basic plot forward moving kind of stuff in the midst of all these other weirdness questions that are going on that there's so much for you to wonder about, even when you're getting no answers at all to anything, it, it keeps you going right, forward, yeah. at least to me. It, it, I think to most people who've read it, you know, that's the sort of, there's a spell that's that we're under too, when you start to read these chapters yeah, of exactly. just going with that weird humming, that's kind of keeping you right. forward. So it's, it's a perfect description of, of kind of how I think a lot of readers feel in these odd chapters too. Right. This whole chapter, almost nothing is explained. And yet there's so much, you, you can't walk away. You can't, I'm sorry. I have to stay here and finish this. I have to find yeah. out and how in, this and ends. And such a cool thing too, because a lot of it is, centered around people trying to come up with explanations for things, but there's no explanation and it just makes it weirder. Mm -hmm. we're through. So, yeah, I feel like I have to say, this is one of just from a sort of what is Wolf's strategy of setting tone and narrative and, and setting this chapter is one of the best. I feel like just to capture that because so much, so few specific things happen, but so many things are laid out for later on and that it doesn't at all feel like an exposition chapter or filler or anything that you're just deeper and deeper in the questions of the chapter. No, no, no. Yeah. I always feel like if I, if I had really wanted to be a writer, <laughs> <laughs> like a, an actual fiction writer, it's the feeling of this chapter is one that I would definitely want to try and capture. And I have no idea if I could. Yeah. This is a, you'd want, yeah, you'd want to duplicate this yeah. over and over and over. So if you have further ideas about the Kamehameha, or the witches, or whether Hildegrin is a robot, or maybe you can say, you idiots, don't you remember him talking about all of those kids that he's working to put through college? <laughs> and we will say more about the Cumaean, of course, later. We hadn't really gone into her much this time because we didn't really have a whole lot of detail about her, just hearsay. So if you have theories about the Cumaean, don't worry, we're going to definitely get to that in the future but if you still want to talk about them feel free to bring it up now reach out to us on facebook at the rereading wolf podcast facebook group or on reddit or by email if you don't want to talk in front of other people but gosh you, sometimes we get some great theories from people on email and i think no no man you should put this out so we can all beat it up and dismantle it and people often apologize for writing long emails to us, which is not a problem at all. Go nuts. No, no, no. I like Especially, it. I mean, if you're going to take the time, go for it because we will definitely read it. We yeah. will we will muddle through no matter how bad the prose is. We, <laughs> we will read through everything to see what you got to say. Right. Twitter and Instagram, too, if you just want a, a quick 
way to get in touch with us. Lots of fun things up on Instagram all the time. And it's always fun to find out what people will retweet or tag us in on Twitter. So yeah, until next time, the flower of dissolution for next time. Thanks for listening. Take care guys. I heard you saw again last evening. Was her hair still blonde? Were her eyes still blue? Were they soft and gentle or filled with tears? Did she still look as hurt after all these years? I lost track of her way back in the 60s. I even heard that she had tried suicide. There were rumors the government killed her career. Did she still look as scared after all these years? Will they ever uncover her terrible secret? And untangle the mystery of her life Will they ever know why she disappeared Was she still as gone after all these years Was she still as impossible, still as voluptuous Still as helpless and full of fears Was she still as provocative, still as compelling late after all these years um let me double check that real quick just to be sure i'm not <laughs> i'm not lying oh shoot i don't have my castle of days i forgot exactly what he says hold on i get it I didn't hear anything you said. <laughs> it, was, it was just a generic kind of. Whoa. I don't know how Charlie Rose did all those episodes with his water glass. He must have dumped water on people every other episode. Sorry about that.